Praise God. So, <clears throat> on grace, uh, today we are continuing with activating grace. Activating grace, because of our time, I will not go into many details, but remember that I told us that for us to see things in reality, we need to go back to the mirror or to the image so that we'll be able to understand some things. And I gave us an example of things in reality that you cannot see. You cannot see your face, you cannot see your back. If you want to see your back, actually you need two mirrors. You place one here, place one in front so that, you know, according to physics and the laws of reflection, you'll be able to see your back. So we know according to the Bible in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, that the law is simply an image of grace. Grace is the, is the rating. Christ is the, he said, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So that we establish that the body is of Christ. Grace is the real thing, but again, there are things in grace that we will not fully understand until we look at the shadow, and then we'll be able to place it in the right perspective in grace. So one of the things I will, where we'll start for today, I gave us many, you know, comparisons and, you know, differences between law and grace. The law was written on stone. His grace was written by the spirit, with the blood of Jesus. And um, the law was written on two stones. The grace was written on five points. The law was received on a mountain. Grace was released on a mountain. So I gave us all those differences. But where we will start today in activating grace is the point that the same way the law is a, was a covenant, grace is also a covenant. Go to Matthew 26 and verse 28. Matthew 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. Actually, the word there, testament, means covenant. In fact, you know, the Bible is divided into two, New Old Testament and New Testament, right? That word there, testament, means covenant. So it is Old Covenant and New Covenant. So the law of Moses was a covenant. The same way the grace that we are talking about is also a covenant, So which is shared for many of the remission of sins. Can you also show me Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. You see the word here now. The mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Eber. So the point I'm just trying to bring across to you this morning is that grace is a covenant. Just the same way the law was a covenant. Now what is a covenant? I tried to explain that last week. That a covenant is a binding contract between two parties, between two people. But the difference now between a contract and the covenant is that contract is written on paper with ink, just like the law. But covenant is a spiritual thing. Covenant is by the blood and by the spirit. Praise the Lord. So covenants are between two parties. And actually, for the covenant or the contract to work, there are responsibilities or terms of, of the contract or the covenant that each of the parties should be able, like I gave instance last week, you signed a contract with a convict for a mobile phone. Their, their responsibility is to provide you with service and airtime and the data. Your responsibility is to pay the, the amount every month. So there is always a two, you know, part of the, of the, um, parties, there is always two, uh, the responsibilities to the parts of the, 
parties that are involved in the covenant. So when we are talking about activating grace, it simply means finding and knowing your own responsibility in that covenant, in that contract. Like if you sign the contract with convict and you don't know that you should pay every month, you don't know that. In fact, it's not going to be possible because before you sign the contract, you already know. But let's assume that you didn't know that you should pay or you didn't know how much. Maybe you chose um, 20 gigabyte of uh, contract, which is 200 crowns. Then you were thinking that you chose 10 gigabyte which is 100 crowns, so you start paying 100 crowns. The thing is that they are going to call you and send you the factura, and you have, to, you have to pay it. And if you don't pay it, they will stop the contract. So that is your responsibility. Now, that, that means activate. You activated that contract by your doing your own responsibilities. So grace, like many people think, or many people believe, grace does not work on its own. Grace has to be activated because it is a covenant. It is a covenant. If you don't play your part, the grace will not work. But the thing is, first of all, you have to know which part, you know, are you supposed to, to play. This is where some people also confuse it. It's not like the law. You know, in the law, you do this, you do this. Yes, grace is not like that, but yet, there is still a responsibility for you. This is what it means to activate the grace, and that is what I'm going to be, you know, treating on. I, I know that time will not be enough to finish it, but God will grant us grace and speed. Praise the Lord. So, now, what do we... Okay, again, remember that I taught us the five points of grace. Now, to activate grace, each of those five points has a, has a term or a responsibility to activate them. Each one. So, it's possible that you are working on this particular grace because you have activated the term of that grace. Meanwhile, this grace is lacking in your life. But this is where many people miss it in the church. They think that if you just activate one grace, then all the, you know, every grace has been activated. No, it doesn't work like that. And that is my responsibility this morning to, to show you from the scriptures. Everything we are going to be doing is basically from the scriptures. Number one, as a basic rule, as a general rule, all the five points of grace are activated by faith. All of them, from number one to number. In fact, everything about the New Testament is by faith. The scripture says anything that is not done by faith is sin, actually. If you are not doing it by faith, it becomes sin, no matter what you do. And that is the difference between the shadow and the real thing. In the in Old Testament, you can, you can just do whatever thing you want to do and get accepted. In the New Testament, no matter what you do, if it is not by faith, it's not accepted. Is that clear? So as a basic rule, all the five points of grace are activated by faith. But each one of them still has a, a, a specific responsibility. So let's begin from point number one. Point the grace point one. What was grace point one? Where, what, where was the first point Jesus released grace? From his back when they scourged him. And which grace did he re release there? The grace for righteousness. Remember the book of Isaiah 53, you know, around verse 4, verse 5, he says that he was wounded for our transgressions. So the, the stripes on his backs brought us salvation. The scripture say he was made sin that we might be the righteousness of God. That grace has been released, but you need to activate it. How do you activate it? Romans chapter 10, verse 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Remember I told you that the basic rule for all of them to be activated is by faith. That is believing. But then there is a specific responsibility. And for the grace for righteousness is just to say it with your mouth. If you can believe it in your heart and say it with your mouth, you are righteous. You are saved. And we see the example in that, you know, when Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary, there were two thieves by his side. One could not say it, and he perished. One said, oh, Jesus, remember me in your paradise. Simple. And Jesus said, today, not tomorrow, today is the day of salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. He activated that grace immediately. So let's look at the shadow and see how they, you know, they activated that grace in the law. And let me also say here that according to Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Christ died on the cross of Calvary so that the blessing of Abraham will be we come on the Gentiles. Now, that simply tells us that most things about grace or the blessing that Jesus released on the cross of Calvary is connected to Abraham. That the blessing of Abraham is not just talking about the blessing, that the grace, the grace Jesus released on the cross of Calvary is connected to Abraham. So, for us, to be able to understand how to activate that grace, we should go back to Abraham and see how he activated a particular grace in his life. Genesis chapter 15 from verse 6. I'm still talking about point one, how to, how to, how to activate the grace for righteousness. From verse 6, the scripture says, and he believed in the Lord and now, start from verse 1, so that we can get a clear. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go shyness, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thy heir, but he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be thy heir. And, and he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Verse 6. And he, that's Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham did not do any other thing to receive righteousness. He did not give tithe. He did not sow seed. He did not sacrifice Isaac. He did not. He only believed, and God counted it to him as righteousness there and then. God, continue. Um, verse 6, now verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of your out of all of the Chaldeans to give thee, no, to give thee this land to inherit it. And verse 8, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? In verse 9, and he said unto him, take me a heifer of three years. Now, this is where God made the covenant. Where, you know, he took, God told him specific animals to bring so that he make the covenant. But the point I'm trying to make, when Abraham believed, he said something. In his own case, this is now where we need to place it in the right perspective under grace. In, in the case of Abraham, can you go back to verse uh, 7 or 8? Let me see, go to 7. And he, no, verse, uh, verse 8. So now look at what Abraham said. You know before, in verse 6, he believed. 
Now look at what he said. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it for him as righteousness. Verse 7. Verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of you. No, verse 8. Verse 8. And he said, yes, Lord God, that is Abraham saying to God now, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? So this is what Abraham said. Now God has showed him the stars and told him, your descendants shall be like the stars of, of the heaven, like the suns in the seashore. And Abraham believed. So because he believed, he has to say something. So what he said was a question of doubt. On the law or in the Old Testament, even though he questioned it, God still honored it. But on the grace, you don't doubt. You don't ask God a question of doubt. You don't say, oh, God, because I believe, uh, how can I know that I'm righteous? How am I, am I righteous now? No. You say, because I believe, I am the righteousness of God. You see the difference now? On the grace, but the principle is still the same. Abraham believed and he said. On the grace, you have to believe and also say. But what you are saying now is different. i give you an illustration, uh, example. In the New Testament, when the angel Gabriel met the woman Elizabeth, that's the wife of the prophet Zechariah, he said, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will give birth to a son and you will call his name um, John, yes. So Elizabeth, or oh, Zachariah, it was Zachariah, not Elizabeth. So Zachariah, the father, he said, how shall this be? No, before then, he came to Mary. Before then, um, the angel came to Mary, and Mary said, how shall this be? And the angel explained to him, explained to her, and said, okay, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you, you will give birth. And then the same angel came to Zechariah and said, your wife will give birth. And Zechariah said, how shall this be? Then the, the angel said, you, you will be dumb. Do you, do you understand now? The same question two people asked. Mary asked, he explained to her, he said, okay, the power of the Mosa will come upon you and you will give birth to a son. And then Zechariah asked, how shall this be? He said, now you, you have to be dumb. You see, the point is that Zechariah was a prophet who was supposed to know. He has been working with God, so he was supposed to know better. And Mary was just a young virgin. So the point, I'm, I'm just bringing it to him. Abraham, because there has never been anybody ahead of him, Nobody has been accounted as righteousness before him. There is no example to follow. So if he asked God, how will I know that I will, my descendant will be like the stars? God was patient enough to explain to him. But under grace, we have many examples, both in the scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the New, even in the present day we are living. We have many examples, so you don't have any reason to doubt again. You cannot ask the same question Abraham asked. Maybe I'm not saying God will make you dumb. <laughs> God will not close your mouth, but that is, that is not living on, that is, you know, we pray the prayer, I will not fall on, on, on that grave, from grace. So if you are doing that, that means you are falling from grace and then living in the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. So we need to put it in the right perspective. But the, the bottom line is that to activate the grace for righteousness, you need to believe in your heart and you need to speak it in your mouth. Simple. If you do that, you are saved. But this is where people make the difference. They think because the grace for righteousness is activated by believing and speaking that all the other graces are activated like that. They say, no, you don't have to do any other thing if you just believe and say it, grace. No, 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 no. There are different points of grace, and they have different, you know, activation points. That's the point I want to bring to you. Secondly, the grace that Jesus released from his back handled two things. There were two things that that grace handled. Number one was righteousness, and number two was sickness and disease. Are you following me? According to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, what did the Bible tell us? That by his stripes we are healed. I 
Are you there? First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Okay. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's the sin, the grace for righteousness was he took away the sins. That we, being dead to sins, should now live unto righteousness. And again, by whose stripes you were healed. And I told us that sin and sickness are like brothers and sisters. So the moment sin left, sickness also was carried away. So now, the grace for, for uh, healing is also almost activated like the grace for righteousness. But the difference is that in speaking, instead of speaking, you know, in righteousness, you just confess it. I confess that uh, I'm the righteousness of God. But in healing, it's also confession, but mainly through prayer. That confession should be converted to prayer. Praise the Lord. Are you following me? Now, go to... James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. The book of James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer will activate the grace for healing in your life. Of course, confession, but make that confession a prayer. Praise the Lord. Then if we look at if we look at the at the law and see how it compares. Give me Numbers chapter 21, verse. Eight, verse, verses 8 and 9, Numbers chapter 21, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had beaten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Did you see that under law, they used a physical serpent, and um, you know, the snake, be, uh, if the snake bites you, Moses, God told Moses, make a, a brass a serpent and hang it on a tree. So when you, a snake bites you, you look at that one, you are healed. Now go back to John chapter, four, chapter 3, verse 14. The book of John, this now is under grace in the New Testament. The book of John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus now is speaking, he said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. Verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the grace for sickness is activated by believing and speaking. And I'm just adding that that speaking is, is more stronger when you make it a prayer. You understand that? Okay, let's move quickly now. That's... Um, that's um, point number what? Number one, grace for righteousness. So what was the second point of grace? The head. So the second point where Jesus released grace was on the head. When they put that crown of thorns on him, blood came out and he released grace. And that grace, I said, was the grace that carried away the curse and release the blessing. Because according to Genesis 3, thorns and thistles were the signs of the curse on the earth. And when the soldiers made a crown of thorns and put on his head, 
he carried away the cause and released the blessing. And we saw that in Galatians 3, 13 and 14, that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles. The first point I want you to understand is that the blessing is a curse remover. The blessing is a curse remover. No, any kind of cause. Ancestral causes, witchcraft causes, demonic oppression, anything that represents a curse in your life may not answer to prayers. This is where, like I say, where people miss it. They say, ah, because you are under grace. Because you are under grace, just believe it by faith. No. Of course, yes, once you are born again, there is a level of grace you will receive that cuts across all these other five points, like the causes, you know, prosperity. But when there is a serious issue, you need to activate it by this principle. So let's still go back to Abraham because it, it was the blessing of Abraham. So Abraham will be the best example to show us how to activate it. Genesis chapter 22 from verse 17 to 18. Genesis 22, 18, and in, the, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Can you start from 15? Let me see if. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Verse 18, now look, look what the angel said, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Why? Because Thou hast obeyed me. This was how Abraham activated the blessing. Remember when he looked at the stars, he believed and he confessed it. What did he receive? Righteousness, not the blessing. He got the blessing. He acti Even though that God has blessed him from, Gen from Genesis 12, the first time God called Abraham, he blessed him. He said, I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. You will do this. But he, that blessing never really manifested on his life until this point. What happened here? Because God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, the son you love, and sacrifice him on, the, on a mountain. And so when Abraham was on that mountain, just at the point he wanted to kill Isaac, an angel spoke and said, now, don't kill the son, don't kill your son. Why? Because I know that you have, you love me and that you have obeyed me. What is the point? To activate the grace for blessing in your life, obedience is the key. Obedience is the key. Remember, remember what I said, a general rule is faith. So to activate the grace for the blessing is faith plus obedience. This is where many people miss it. Faith alone or believing alone, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough. It's not enough. You have to add obedience. What are you going to obey? Anything God says to you to do. God spoke to Abraham, sacrifice your Isaac. I don't know what is your own Isaac. Whatever thing God asks you to do, the moment you obey the voice of God, you activate the blessing in your life. And that carries away the cause. And I want to make mention here also that, you know, I say that grace for healing is released by believing and speaking or praying. Sometimes sicknesses that are as a result of a curse or a result of demonic oppression will not answer to prayer because it is not, you know, the grace that deals with it. The grace that we deal with it is the grace of the blessing. That is why you see there are testimonies that somebody is sick, he has gone to hospital, he has prayed, they lay hands on him, nothing worked. Until I heard the testimony until the woman came to the church and started sweeping the church. 
started, you know, mopping the floor, mopping the floor, clipping, sweeping the church. As he's sweeping the church, he went back, she went back again to the hospital and they couldn't find that sickness again. It therefore means that that sickness was a demonic attack. It's not a, a medical issue. So it has to be dealt with with the blessing to remove that cause. And that blessing is activated by obedience. So in her case, God told her to go and sweep the floor. That is obedience. So whatever thing God tells you to do, the moment you start doing it, you release the blessing, and the blessing will take any cause in your life. Praise the Lord. Like I said, this is where people miss it. They say, under grace, you don't need to. Yes, we don't need to do what people did in the law, but we can have a glimpse of how we should place it on under grace. Under grace, you don't say, ah, because I'm under grace, I don't do anything. No. Grace is a covenant. Just know that today. It's a covenant and you have a responsibility. So I'm showing you your responsibility. The grace for blessing is only activated by your obedience for God or love for God and obedience to the voice of God. Now I'm going to stop here because of our time. But let me give you one more. What was the third point that he released grace? He released grace, no, the hands first. Side was the last one. So he released grace on his hands, the third one on his feet, the fourth one, and on his side, the fifth one. So the, the grace that he released on his hands, I told us was the grace for prosperity. Believe me, prosperity is included in the salvation package. Anybody that tells you that prosperity is a sin is not telling you the truth. Poverty is not a sign of righteousness. Prosperity is included in the salvation package, yes. But you have to do it the righteous way, the Bible way, because the grace has been released. Now, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Look at the grace that, that Jesus released for us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now the question I ask is, where was Jesus made sin? Where, where, did, where did Jesus become sin that we may be the righteousness of God? On the cross, good. Where did Jesus carry away our sickness that we might be healed? On the cross. Where did Jesus carry away the cause that the blessing of Abraham may come upon us? So now, where do you think that Jesus was made poor? Stay in Second Corinthians 8, 9. Where, where do you think that Jesus was made poor? Still on the cross. He was made poor on the cross. And the point at which he was made poor was when they pierced his hands. When they pierced his hands, blood started gushing out. His hands started bleeding. That was poverty. That was the grace he was releasing. But now, pay attention. He said that through his poverty, you might be rich. What does it mean that through that poverty? What does it mean that through poverty? It means the same way his hands were bleeding with blood. Your hands also should bleed with something, and that is simply giving. You cannot attain supernatural prosperity without giving. This is, this is just the truth. You know, people say, ah, don't give because uh, we are under grace. Well, as a matter of fact, there is a point of prosperity that you can get to, but until you start to give, you will not get to the level, to the level that God wants to bring you to. You go through his poverty by giving. Let's, let's see it again from the life of Abraham. Go to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. Uh, Genesis chapter 14 from verse 14. So we are going to see something here. And when Abraham heard that his brother 
was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan, verse 15, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus, 16, and uh, he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people, 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shedolama, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. And Mekizah, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and uh, blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thy enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. That's Abraham gave um, Melchizedek tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said, unto, Okay, now stay. Go to verse 18. Now, this is the first point we see this name in the scripture, Melchizedek. We are going to look at who is that Melchizedek. But see, Melchizedek gave Abraham bread and wine. This is a, a significant of grace. The bread is the body of Jesus. The wine is the blood of Jesus as we take in Holy Communion. Actually, that Melchizedek was the Christ incarnate. Praise the Lord. So as a matter of fact, this was grace. This was where grace was exemplified. The Melchizedek met, met Abraham. He never asked Abraham tithe. He never said, give me tithe before I bless you. No, he gave him bread and wine. Take. That was grace released. He blessed him. And then Abraham, out of his own will, gave him the tithe. Now, the point I'm trying to make, for you to activate the grace for prosperity in your life, you need to go through the poverty of Christ, and how to go through that poverty is through giving. No matter what name you call it, it must have to be given. Because it is in giving that your hand bleeds like the hands of Jesus was bleeding. But in the case of Abraham, it was titan that he used to activate that blessing because if you notice, after he gave the tithe, the Melchizedek blessed him again. I'm going to end with this. I'm just going to give you some, some key points that you need to know as we round up about who is this Melchizedek. Number one, Melchizedek is the Christ incarnate. You see this in Hebrews chapter 7 from verse 1 to 9. Melchizedek was Christ himself. Melchizedek is the high priest. You know, so many people argue that we are all priests in the New Testament. We are kings and priests. Everybody is a priest. Yes, we are all priests, but we are not high priests. We only have one high priest. And according to the scriptures, it is the high priest that received the tithe, which is Melchizedek. And in the scripture, the Bible tells us that Jesus has become our own high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So he received tithes from us today. Where did he bring, okay, now I'm out of time. We have to close, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's be on our feet. We'll take it next time. But the point I hope you have understood this morning is that the different points of grace has to be activated by specific principles. You need to understand that. Grace is a covenant. And I pray that God, by his, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, will open your eyes to see and to understand your responsibilities. That as you do your own part, God is faithful to do his own part. That this grace will speak in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. Is there any one of us here that is sick? I would have loved to pray for you, but because of time, I will not now. But if you meet with me after the service, I can pray with you and anoint you with the oil. 
But under this grace, remember I told you, when the word of God, the Bible says God gave the word and he healed them. When there is a word and teaching coming in any subject, there is grace and anointing for that particular subject. As the teaching on grace is coming, the, 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 the anointing for healing is being released. And therefore, I speak to you, anyone that is sick, receive your healing now in the name of Jesus. Is there any kind of curse in your life, ancestral curses, generational curses, witchcraft curses, curses from the coven of the, of the witch doctors, by the blessing of Abraham, their curses are broken in your lives in the name of Jesus. And the same way Melchizedek met Abraham and released grace on him, gave him bread and wine without even asking him. That grace is released for you today. In the name of Jesus, may you prosper in the works of your hands. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Receive all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.